Today's reading is from Mark 1, 14 to 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I, uh, man, I love, I love that line of that song. Uh, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. As we were singing, I was just being reminded in my own life about the way God met a, a depressed, discouraged, uh, sexually addicted, uh, doubt-filled, bitter young man, an 18-year-old, and I had an encounter with grace, and it changed everything about me. The way the love of God pursues us, it's not just theory in my life. I know it. I felt it. I've seen it. God has met me in my darkest moments, in my deepest sins, in my greatest pains, and he has loved me. Man, if you hear nothing else this morning, may you be reminded of a God who is after you. He's just after you. One of the interesting things that I'm learning as being a, uh, being a lead pastor is part of caring for a community is this realization that you, you just carry this burden of love on your life for people no matter where you go. As Lindsay mentioned this week, we were in Montana uh, leading a, a, a missions base in their, in their staff retreat. It's a, a missions organization with close to 200 uh, full-time staff missionaries. And it's amazing, no matter where I am or where I go or what I'm doing, uh, I carry you with me. And you know, there's these two things that I'm constantly reminded of as a pastor. One, uh, that I'm actually accountable to Jesus for how I care about you. Listen, as a pastor, I have a real fear of God. Um, not in the sense of the, the worldly term that I cower because I don't trust his nature, but in the biblical way of understanding I have a reverent position in front of an honorable God. I carry that with me. And I also carry with me just this deep love for you that longs for you, that has dreams for you, that believes things for you, that I can't turn on and off. It's, it's the unique burden really, of pastoral ministry. It's, it's in many ways, for those of you that have kids, it's part of the burden of a father's heart that attaches to this pastoral role. So know this today. Nobody's, nobody's playing religious games with you. No matter what's going on in your world, no matter how you're doing, no matter what you think about the local church, no matter whether you know me or not, I want you to know, at least know this, you're in a place that actually values you and loves you and cares about you, is deeply concerned for your good, and is trying to be as faithful to Jesus as possible. And even in that heart, I wanna, I wanna preface what I wanna talk to you about this morning. It's, it's not a typical sermon, and, um, and honestly, I, I, I doubt it'll come across as necessarily the most eloquent or poignant teaching I've ever given. Because there's something in my heart for you today that just feels a lot more like a burden. That I, 
I want to share with you, and I want to open up to you. And I need to talk to you about some realities in our world, and I want to talk to you about some aspects of the culture that we belong to, because the burden that's in my heart is that you and I don't fully understand what it means to be Christ followers in a secular world. And because we don't fully understand what it means to be Christ followers in a secular world, the world around us is beating us alive and we don't actually even understand it's happening. Part of this conversation you might totally resonate with. It might put language to some of your own story. You might go, I have no idea what he's talking about and why he thinks it's a big deal. But I wanna tell you this, whether you resonate with some of the things that I'm about to talk to you about or not, I wanna tell you this, someone you love does. And so somehow, some way, we as a church family need to understand some of the implications of what I wanna share with you today because even if you go, that's interesting, that's not my story. People you love in the room, that is their story. People you love in your family, that is their story. And certainly almost everyone you know under 40 outside of the walls of this church that doesn't love and follow Jesus, it is their story. And if we're going to be Christ followers, in a secular world, then we have to understand some of the things that are happening around us and happening to us. Because I think when we have language for them, it's gonna give us an authority and a power to walk in the midst of them, stand up against them, and be the people that God has called us to be. So I ask you this morning for grace to, to not judge this morning by how impressive or eloquent I can be. I'm gonna fail you there. Or even this morning for like, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not even gonna spend too much time in the scriptures, not even because that's our heart, but because I just have limited time and I wanna, I wanna share something with you. So I just even ask you to put your defenses down, your judgments down, and just come in a vulnerability of heart with me and enter into a story that I think really matters. I love this moment in Mark, which is captured in Matthew as well. Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, coming along and declares this statement, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What a powerful statement, and a statement the vast majority of us don't understand. Jesus making these demonstrative claims that you and I see through our very, very thin lens of evangelicalism. Most of us, if, I, if I'm honest, and this is not a judgment, this is just something I've learned to be true from people and, and of my own past experiences. If I were to say, explain to me the kingdom of God, most of us would go, oh, I think that's your job, <laughs> right? We freeze a little bit. It's interesting here that Jesus' central message is about this idea called the kingdom of God, that very few of us even really understand the heartbeat of it, let alone the implications of it. And I think it's interesting that if we're going to follow and take Jesus seriously, that there are massive parts of his message that we don't have deep meaning about. This morning isn't necessarily gonna unpack the nature of the kingdom of God, but, but know this, when, when Jesus uses this phrase, the kingdom of God, what he's talking about is the rule and reign of God on planet Earth. Jesus is saying in, in, in our terms and in our language, the time has come. The, the rule and reign of God has come back to humankind. What, what humans have been aching for, God returning and making himself known among humanity has now happened in your midst. Jesus is saying there is something really good taking place. God has come back and he's making himself known to humanity. And then he says this phrase, repent and believe. I, I believe in these phrases, repent and believe, as I'm sure many of you do. But it's interesting for us how that carries some baggage, isn't it? Repentance is one of those words that for anyone that kind of grew up in maybe like a more religious, uh, more kind of fundamentalist Southern Christian background, you hear the word repent and you feel like you have PTSD, right? 
And it's just like, how, how, I don't understand how this character of this really good God and this really good Father and this really perfect Jesus, central to his message, is this concept of this mean, harsh, demanding repentance. But for many of us, that's actually because we don't understand the fullness of repentance and also because many of us actually have more allegiance to the secular story around us than to the Christ story walking within us. This is the implications that we need to begin to understand. You know, I love there's this moment. There's a historian named Josephus. Potentially, you've heard about him. He was, a, he was actually Jewish himself, but he was, in, he was uh, part of the, the Roman army and basically did uh, different travels and trips for them and political agendas. He's one of the most trusted historians uh, of the Roman Empire. And, and Josephus tells these reports about how times, what Josephus would do is that he would go as an ambassador on behalf of Rome to basically a small village or pagan community that was about to be demolished by them. And he would come as a peace offering, right? And this is basically how Rome did peace. You come on our side or we murder everyone in the village, right? That's the value of empire. Believe or ever, everyone's gonna get murdered, right? And it's interesting that when Josephus stood up, and we see this twice recorded in his writings, when he came to these small villages and he begged on behalf of Rome that people would just assimilate rather than just go through the violence of war, he would say this phrase, repent and believe in me. It's interesting, isn't it? That Josephus, a commander of an army, showing up to a smaller town that was about to be destroyed by Rome, would come and he would use this language, repent and believe in me. So there's two implications of this. Either Josephus was walking around Rome going, I am the living son of God, come to me for salvation so that I can fix everything in your life. Or maybe there was some meaning that Jesus had in this statement that we've missed. I think the latter is probably the more likely. That what Jesus was intending, not to say that it didn't have all of the implications of what Jesus has taught us about who he is and the salvation that he brings and the reality of the gospel, but that what Jesus was actually saying in the same way was the same substance that Josephus was saying. You have chosen the wrong team. You have an allegiance to the wrong side. And I'm here, I'm here as an agent of peace. Come and switch your allegiances with me. The kingdom you belong to is gonna harm you and fail you. Come and switch your allegiances. This phrase, believe in me, is saying, come and be loyal to what I'm asking you. Jesus, in his essence, is trying to say, come and give me your allegiance because my kingdom deserves your allegiance and the kingdom you currently belong to does not. Now, thankfully, Jesus is different than Rome. So Jesus' message wasn't a message of hate and violence and, and force and how he wanted to destroy you no matter what your choice was, but the inherent message stays the same. Jesus is looking at us and he's saying, the kingdom you have chosen belong to belong to is misleading you. Come, repent, believe. Come and give me your allegiance. Come on my side. I'm telling you, the kingdom that I have brought is the kingdom you were naturally born to belong to. Come and believe, right? Jesus' primary invitation to repent and believe is all about your allegiances. And I want us to see this because this helps us as Christ followers in a world realize that at the very inception of Christianity was a question of where do your allegiances lie? And see, for us, something that we need to understand is that we have grown up in this idea that you and I belong into this pseudo-Christian empire. There is no pseudo-Christian empire. There is no reality of a Christian nation. And I'm not even trying to say that in like a, like a deep, like conservative, like, oh man, we gotta take our world back. I mean, I believe in the mission of Jesus and I wanna take our world back, but I'm not even trying to imply anything political about this. I just wanna tell you the scenario that's actually happened. You and I no longer belong to a kingdom of Western Christianity. In act, the whole kingdom was a facade anyways built around political agendas and ideology and power and not around the substance of Jesus. 
We have to stand, and I love the way my, one of my friends and mentors puts it this way. John Tyson goes, most Christians still think that they're living in Israel, but one day they're all gonna wake up and realize they're not living in Israel anymore. They're living in Babylon. Our story isn't the story of Israel. And, and, and our story is the story of Babylon. You and I are Daniels in a Babylon world. We are Christ followers in a secular age. And this has significant ramifications for us because for the first time in our conscious history, you and I actually in saying yes to Jesus need to choose where our allegiances actually go. See, this has been the problem of Christian empire thinking. See, when we, we, we buy into the myth that we live in a Christian empire, we buy into the myth that a Christian empire is even a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's a terrible thing. Jesus is the only one who has the authority to lead a Christian community, right? This is every time we try to attempt these ideas of Christian power, we always fail ourselves because Jesus is the only one trustworthy with power. So we, we, we forget that now we live in a moment in culture that says, oh, you, you've actually got to decide you've actually got to realize you take part in two kingdoms and only one kingdom can actually have your allegiances. And because so many of us don't realize that and we grew up in this idea that I'm a Christian, my neighbors are Christian, my, my country is Christian, it's founded on Christian principles, I can actually do whatever I want to do and I can be fine. I can just kind of blend in with culture and go wherever it wants to go because I'm a Christian in a Christian culture. No, you're not, and you actually haven't been for a long time. And so that kind of lack of thinking, what it's done is it's clashed two kingdoms together, and without knowing it and realizing it, the vast majority of us have given much of our allegiance to secularism and not to Jesus. I, I want to tell you this this morning. I believe the greatest and most profound reason that there is a radical movement of doubt in our world. And why so many young followers of Jesus are walking away from the faith and are walking away from the truth of who Jesus is is because by its very nature, secularism gives birth to doubt. And if your allegiance is to secularism and not to Jesus, you are going to be having a deep internal conflict of which master deserves your allegiance. And what we know is you can only serve one master. You can only belong to one person. You can only belong to one kingdom. You can only belong to one thing. And because the voice of secularism and the voice of Jesus are at war within us, we feel the deep, deep schism that leads us to places of frustration and doubt. I, I wanna paint this picture for you because I wanna try to at least help give you an idea and language for what's happening in our world and potentially what's happening inside of you because this is significant. See, and one thing that we need to see is that to say yes to Jesus is to say no to our other allegiances. Now, I understand that that line doesn't convince anyone in the room that's wrestling with doubt why Jesus deserves my yes. In fact, that's not even just because of time. I, don't, I have the inability to get there today. This is really part one of something that I'm gonna finish next Sunday. Next Sunday is why we actually have a deep hope that we can with certainty put our yes in Jesus and why that's not a foolish thing to do. But we need to wrestle with this. For those of us in the room that are Christ followers, to say yes to Jesus is to say no to all other allegiances. I mean, you get this, right? I'm married 14 years. I'm in love with my wife. She's awesome. She's not here right now. I think she's serving in kids. Here's, here's, but here you get this. My yes to Emily is pretty meaningless, except that my yes comes with 3.5 billion no's. Now, I'm not saying that all the ladies in humanity are into me, but I am telling you that, you know, I, I do bald good, okay? So it's, it's a good thing to be Phil Manginelli in this world. I'm joking. You, you know, I'm not, but, but, you get, but you get the point of what I'm trying to say, right? My yes, my yes to Jesus isn't contingent on my yes, my yes, to con my yes to Jesus is contingent on my nose. 
And see, so many of us, the reason we're struggling with deep places in our faith is because we've said yes to Jesus and we've said yes to 10,000 other things. And we wonder why we have deep conflict in our spirit and in our souls. You can't say yes to Jesus and say yes to secularism at the same time. They are opposing forces. They are not going in the same direction. And we have to come to the place where we realize when we say yes to Jesus, we are saying no to all of our other allegiances. And I think he is worthy and true enough for us to believe that. My wife would have rolled her eyes if she was here. And friends, this is just, I just say this to give you hope. This is just the biblical story. Here, here's the one encouraging thing. You wanna know for the next 50 years the good news about what's happening? You'll actually be able to relate to the Bible. The Bible is written to an embattled minority that has an empire that disdains what they believe. Welcome to biblical Christianity. You've ever wanted the Bible to come alive in your life before? You've ever read the scriptures? You wanna know why the scriptures were boring to you before? Because you were convinced you lived in a Christian empire that didn't exist. You want to see the Bible actually begin to come alive in your heart? You begin to realize that the story of 1 Peter is your story. The story of Colossians is your story. The story of the Ephesians is your story. You and I are now an embattled minority holding on to the king named Jesus in the middle of a culture that says you're not allowed to believe that anymore. And we have a place of recognizing our own story now that gives us deep meaning in life and purpose. Colossians 2, 6 through 8. You can go ahead and bring that up. It says this, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And listen to this next line. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty the seed according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. This, this was what the Colossians were facing, a deep belief in Jesus that the world around them said, you can't do that. You can't believe that. You're not allowed to do that. And Paul said, church, you can't, you can't let thought take you captive. Let, let's go to the next one. A passage out of Romans 12. Again, passage, you know, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You, can, you see it everywhere, and Paul does. What he understands is that to follow Jesus is to walk into massive resistance. And you, as a Christ follower, have to have a depth of faith that knows how to walk into resistance. 1 Peter 1 says this, 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, right? I mean, I could go on and on and on. This is just the biblical story. I said this, but the story of the scriptures is about an embattled minority that had their faith pushed, mocked, tested, and punished under the power of a resistant empire, and they change the world. This is becoming our story too. See, the reason so many of us are struggling with issues like doubt, insecurity, depression, anxiety, and shame is because we've given way too much of our allegiance to secularism. Jesus isn't producing that fruit. That's not happening from your, from your Christ relationship. It's happening with your relationship with the world. I love Brene Brown. I don't know how many of you read her. Brene Brown is a author and a profound academic on the issue of shame. There's much I could say that she brings value, but I love just this simple line, and it helps us understand what's going, what's going on. We are the most in debt, medicated, obese, and addicted generation of adults in American history. Listen to this again. We are the most in debt, medicated, obese, and addicted generation of adults in American history. I could take the rest of our time and just point out facts about how this is true. Again, I wish I had two hours to be able to navigate some of these conversations with you. Let me give you one implication. I, I mean, I could give you many, but let me give you one, right? One of the foundational claims of a secular society is that nothing can actually be trusted, right? The only thing that's true, this is a secular claim. This is not like a Christian's take on a secular claim. This is a, a secular claim. The only thing that can be trusted is that nothing can be trusted. The only thing that's true is that nothing is true, right? These are philosophies of the culture that live around us. 
Now here's interesting, a Pew Research poll, I actually quoted this, an older poll recently, a brand new one came out, and they asked the question, in our generational brackets, uh, baby boomer, generation X, and millennial, how do people respond to issues of trust? So basically, if you're between like um, uh, 18 and 35, you're a millennial. If you're kind of between like 36 and like 52, you're basically a Gen X, and if you're older than that, you're a millennial, or you're a, you're a baby boomer, right? So just to kind of, in case you don't kind of know those statistical things. Baby boomers, baby boomers, my parents' generation would say that uh, 78% of baby boomers answered the question, are most people trustworthy? They said, yes, most people are trustworthy. When you go down to, to Generation X, that number drops all the way down to 53%. Then when you go down to millennials, current generation, 18 to 35-ish, only 19% say yes, most people are trustworthy. That means 81% of people under 35 think the majority of people, the majority of structures, the majority of situations, and the majority of things are untrustworthy. I just even wanna tell you, if you're sitting here and you're in the age bracket and you're wondering, why do I struggle with trust so much? Because you're a product of your culture. See, it's not a millennial problem. This is what we have to understand. Trust isn't a millennial problem. Trust is a secular problem. And millennials are just the first generation to, to really grow up in a secular society. So they are affected by it far more than other generations are. I, I could go on and on, but the secular story has gripped us. Secularism is the new religion of our new empire. It demands your allegiance and is increasing is telling us that exclusive faithfulness to Jesus is not an option. Guys, I wanna make sure you hear me right because we can accidentally be using the same language and talking about different things. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about cultural wars. I'm not talking about those kind of concepts which easily commission us into conservative or liberal way of thinking. Listen. Among us are people who have deep conservative convictions, and among us are people who have deep liberal convictions as they're trying to steward out their life and the way in this world. I'm not speaking to that world. What I'm talking about is this. Jesus is inviting us into a love relationship with him that says it calls our allegiance and says we can belong to no other. That kind of exclusivism is no longer wanted we're welcome in our world. And so we're forced to do three, one of three things. You only have three options. You are either gonna syncretize, which means you're gonna take your faith and you're gonna blend it with secularism. I have deep problems with this. I think this is hurting people and it's a lie. And we're seeing it happen all over the place. Or we become separatists, which basically means let's go buy a bunker, buy some shotguns and hide out until the rapture happens, right? Okay, um, which I don't think is gonna happen anytime soon and I think is a really bad idea and is totally unfaithful to Jesus, right? So what is our third option? Our third option is called being in exile. Realizing that you are a sojourner, you are a foreigner, you are somebody or a citizen of another kingdom, but yet you belong to a physical kingdom. That you and I have to navigate this new way of life called exiles. We are Daniel. We are Daniel's friends. We are in Babylon and our faith has to become much more deep and rooted because with the falseness of a Christian empire is crashing around us. When I have this conversation with people, commonly this is what gets asked of me. Phil, what do you mean by secularism? What do you mean by that? I guess I understand the word, but what do you mean by that? I think that's a fair question. And I wanna, I wanna give you a thought on this and forgive me if this comes with the air of, of intellectualism or an attempt at just language with a lot of big words. I think it's understand we have three, we have three cultural forces happening in secularism. I want, I want you to hear me on this. I just stay with me, all right? Attention spans, we got this. <laughs> first, postmodernism. Postmodernism is the first idea, basically as simple as this. 
Uh, modernism was the idea of rationalism, which that uh, foundational truths could be proven, that you could find foundational uh, truths of logic, you could build your life around them. It was the philosophy of the 1800s and the 1900s. It was the whole idea of logic and reason, right? Postmodernism just means what's after modernism, right? So postmodernism is just the philosophy that came after rationalism, and in many ways, it was a rejection of rationalism, and it said there are not foundational truths that you can build your life on. So you and I live in a postmodern world that rejects rationalism, that says there are not foundational truths that you and I can build our lives on, can build our societies on, can build our belief systems on. So postmodernism, this is happening. And the interesting thing is philosophers are already talking about this, how postmodernism is actually already on its way out and giving birth to what the next main belief system of the world would be, which they call critical realism. And critical realism is just simply the death of belief. Right? So right now in a postmodern world, it's kind of like, hey, you can believe whatever you want to believe because there's no foundational truth claims. And what that eventually leads to is, is the death of belief itself, right? Because the, the misguided idea that truth is relative, all of us from a logical perspective and go, ah, but is it? But is it? Gravity doesn't feel relative. I'm pretty sure there's some foundational truth claims that the world is built on. Whether you take it from a, cre a creator perspective or an agnostic secular perspective, we all see the realities of foundational truth claims. And what's happening now is that the world is realizing actually the illogical belief system of secularism is fading away or of postmodernism is fading away and it's giving birth to the death of belief. The second is this, pluralism. Pluralism. Basically the idea that every belief system has equal value and they cannot be judged, they cannot be told they're wrong, and they all deserve a place at the buffet of options, right? A pluralistic society says what I believe is not more important than what you believe, and what they believe is not more important than what they believe. Every idea deserves equal footing at the table of belief, right? It's an interesting idea, and many of us, can I tell you this? I meet many young Christians who feel fear, about sharing their faith with other people. And when you get to the root of why they feel fear sharing their faith with other people is because they feel deep conflict about the idea that I may believe something which indicates what I believe you believe is wrong. And I don't know how to actually have the courage to do that or if I even believe that. And then you go, well, why do you believe that? Because that's not certainly not Jesus. Jesus was pretty clear and hopeful about what he believed. It's because you and I have been attached to the concepts of pluralism. And when you think about it, pluralism is actually a deeply faulted belief system. It's not true. I'm not saying that we don't need to live in an open market of ideas. Freedom is good. We need freedom, and freedom means that people get to believe whatever they want to believe. But the idea that pluralism demands that all belief systems have the same and equal value in and of themselves is not true. And it's really easy to point out because you and I in this room would go, a belief system that advocates for pedophilia is not something that I think holds equal value to other belief systems in the world. A tribal belief system in Africa that advocates for cannibalism is not a belief system that holds equal value to the other systems of the world. You and I can actually step back and realize the very nature of pluralism falls apart once we finally put all the table of ideas onto the table. Here's the secret lie of pluralism. What it's telling you is you need to be tolerant and the only thing you can't believe is that your belief is the right one. And we're buying into it. It's affecting us. And last is secularism, human secularism. Human secularism is just basically the idea of this. God is dead. There is nothing supernatural in the world. There is no supernatural hope. There is nothing transcendent. That idea of transcendence is there's something bigger than me outside of this world. Human secularism says, not only is that not true, but your government, your family, and your church has lied to you and has put you in bondage and slavery, and you need to free yourselves from these concepts. This is actually something that, that comes directly, I want you to hear this, this comes directly from human secularism, right? A secular lifestyle, secular humanism incorporates the enlightenment principle of individualism, which celebrates the emancipation of the individual from the evil traditional controls of family, church, and state. That's not my take on human secularism. That's human secularism's take on human secularism. 
celebrate the emancipation of the individual from the evil traditional controls of family, church, and state. Okay, here's again, we just gotta come back to this. Well, is this worth believing? Uh, listen, I know some of us grew up in our families. I don't, I don't mock when people, people walk through bad families that somebody who grew up in a hard or difficult family could go, oh, family. But whether you take a position from, a, from the essence of a creator or you take a position of the, in the essence of an agnostic evolutionist, family is central to the beautiful formation of what it means to be a human. It is not an evil construct of society. It is a deeply embedded truth in our world that actually protects us, cares for us, and creates us into who we are. Some of these implications we just need to start thinking through. So, so why does this matter? This is, why does this matter? Why does this matter at all? Because you and I are being affected by this and we're not even aware of it. The more and more I walk with people, I find out, oh, we're all secularists. So many of us are secretly struggling with doubt and we don't know how to communicate it. So many of us are riddled with insecurities and we don't know who to go to with it. Many of us are clouded by shame to the point of self and self-harm and we don't know where to turn with it. We have been deeply affected by the culture around us that says your life doesn't have transcendent meaning. See, human beings can't turn off their ache for meaning. You can't do it. It doesn't matter whether you're talking to a Christian or you're talking to a Buddhist or you're talking to an atheist. It doesn't matter. Every human has a deep, deep longing for something bigger than themselves. I say it this way. Human beings can turn off their ache for meaning. And when you live in a culture that says you can't find that meaning in a creator, we naturally try to find the value of our existence in two places that can't sustain it, our jobs and our relationships. And when those things inevitably fail you because they can't sustain your longing for transcendence, it puts you into a radical bondage of fear, depression, anxiety, shame, and doubt. Out. So you want to know what we do? And listen, I'm talking about this is the millennial crisis in the world. You want to know why millennials have this deep, deep passion that their jobs have to have purpose? Because they don't believe they can find their meaning in a God story. And so they're putting a God level of value in their jobs, and they're wondering why their jobs are always failing them. And if they're not doing it in their jobs, they're doing it in their relationships. Why are people getting married later and later and later? Because they're looking for a marriage that doesn't exist. I talk to people about the secular people about the kind of marriage they're looking for and they're like, oh, I wanna find somebody that just is like my soulmate and we get every experience together and the sex is just incredible and, and it's just like unending joy and happiness and we fight like three times in 60 years and I know that person's out there, right? And you're like, dear Lord, where did you, like, this isn't you, what fantasy world have you bought into? I fought with my wife three hour, times in the last hour, right? <laughs> this is not, what we've done is because we, we are aching for transcendence, but we can't put it in a God anymore. We have to put it in our jobs, and we have to put it in our relationships, and guess what? This is the bad news. Your jobs and your relationships cannot sustain your ache for meaning. And then when they fail you, and they will fail you, you feel this deep internal shame. Why can't I get this right? Why can't I figure this out? Wanderlust, think about the, 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 the cardinal campaign of a millennial generation. In its essence, wanderlust is simply the search for meaning. Why do we need to go on such a grand search for meaning? Because we've bought into a lie that God can't give me that kind of meaning. These schisms now happen internally in our souls and in our person. Even so many of us, right, as Christ followers, we're dealing with this. My dad, my dad, one of the most faithful, profound men of God I've ever met, shaped me into the man I am, worked 37 years faithfully at the post office. He hated it. And he loved me. And he found his value in his love relationship with Jesus and he found his value in being a father to his kids and a husband to his wife, and he changed the lives of many. When I tell that, that my dad lived a beautiful life, a Christ-centered life, a deeply impacting life, to most young people, they go, oh, I, could, I just couldn't do that. I'm not even saying that that's God's heart for you. Hey, have a job you hate for the rest of your life and just suffer, right? 
I'm not saying that God's plan for you is how miserable you should be every day. But the reason my dad was able to sustain that, and so many of us aren't able to sustain that, is my dad was able to find his meaning in the person in the presence of Jesus and in loving his family so he didn't have to put false expectations on his job. A job just got to be a job. And so many of us, we don't have the ability to do that. And the cornerstone of why we don't have the ability to do that is because we haven't learned how to find our true meaning in our creator. And we're still trying to find it in our jobs and in our relationships. I love this quote by Herman Vavink, the more abundantly the benefits of civilization come streaming our way, the emptier our lives become. With all of its wealth and power, it only shows that, my thing cut off, the human heart in which God has put eternity is so huge that all the world is too small to satisfy it. It's too small. So this is what secularism has done. And Lindsay, if you want to come up, we're going to move towards a close. Secularism has moved us from faith to doubt. Secularism has moved us from love to insecurity. Secularism has moved us from community to individualism. Secularism has moved us from contributing to consuming. And secularism has moved us from rest to exhaustion. Here's how I know I'm right. (laughs) That's the good thing every pastor should say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> here's how I know I'm right the, these aren't self-created terms okay this is what cultural commentators secular philosophists agnostic secularists are saying is happening in our generation this is what secularism is doing to us it's filling us with doubt it's filling us with insecurity it's filling us with individualism it's filling us as consumers and it's making us exhausted. And I'm not talking about an external exhaustion, I'm talking about an internal exhaustion. You know that thing I was talking about when I just can't turn off this thing in me for you? Is how many of you I know are just dying in anxiety, fear of failure, you feel like a fraud, you feel like you're gonna get found out and let, let go of, abandoned. Insecurities and depression is raging this war inside of you. And because it's raging this war inside of you, you are exhausted. You're exhausted. And it's robbing you from the very life that Jesus has for you. When we look at that list, the vast majority of us will go, yeah, I do deal with doubt, I do deal with insecurity, I do deal with individualism, I do deal with consuming, I do deal with exhaustion. And what I wanna help you see is that there's a reason why you're dealing with that. And it's okay. And if you know there's a reason why you're dealing with that, that also means there's a remedy that you don't have to deal with this anymore. So I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to make large sweeping statements. I understand sometimes anxiety and depression come from biological realities and thyroid issues. And I, listen, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't live in a complex world that has complex situations. Of course we do. But the vast majority of us are dealing with these kinds of issues because we live in a secular world and it is punching us in the face and we don't even realize it's happening. There's, there's good news, uh, which is next Sunday, unfortunately. <laughs> so, <laughs> fill for the win on that one. But there's good news. You don't have to be secular. I, I, know, I know that sounds like a... <laughs> Don't you wish it was that easy? Oh, thanks, Phil. Life is fixed. Everything's wonderful, right? But I mean it. You don't have to be secular. And what we're gonna talk about next week is actually when you realize secularism is is a boogeyman that's actually an annoying, chirping, tiny dog that doesn't deserve your allegiance. It doesn't have substance. It doesn't have truth claims. It doesn't have logic. 
It doesn't have any epiphany. Do you, do you realize nothing has happened in the last 15 years of the world that suddenly this great epiphany where we're like, oh yeah, I guess believing in Jesus is dumb. It has, hasn't happened. Secularism is just a big bully that demands your allegiance and has been pushing you around for a long time. And when you realize he doesn't deserve that kind of place in your life, you're gonna find freedom that your heart aches for. Here's what I would say to you. Jesus is calling us back. In the words of Jesus, repent and believe. Give me your allegiances and I will give you meaning. Come and follow me. Isn't it great to go back to our initial story? Jesus stands in the shores of Galilee and says, repent and believe. The good news, the kingdom of God has come. The reign of God has come back, come. And then he leans out to men who are fishing and he says, come and follow me. I will give you meaning. Come and follow me, I will give your life purpose. Friends, Jesus is the only one, the only one who can give your life meaning. He's the only one who can satisfy that transcendent ache in your heart. And I, I say this to you this morning, whether you're here or you're a Christ follower, you're here or you're a seeker, you're here and you're a young, jaded evangelical. I tell you this with all of the conviction of my life. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy your ache for meaning. And if you would learn the rhythms of taking off your allegiance to a secular culture and putting your allegiance back on to a crucified king named Jesus who loves to wash the feet of his friends and his enemies and has life abundantly in his kingdom, who calls us to this radical counterculture of love and grace and acceptance, it could change everything about you. It could literally change everything about you. I love the story of Daniel's three friends, and this is where we'll close. In the scriptures, it talks about how an evil king, this is my summation, quick summation, says, you will worship me. You will worship me. And if you don't, I will murder you. They respond, king, we will not worship you. We already have our allegiances. Come and do whatever you wanna do, but we will not worship you. So the king decides he's gonna throw them in the fire, and I love what they say back to him. King, we are convinced of this, that if you throw us in the fire, our God will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we bow to him and to him alone. You know the story, right? King never, he throws them in, and he's counting and he's looking in, suddenly three men in the fire, but why are there four? God's supernatural deliverance, participation, and walking with exiles. I remember the time I heard Desmond Tutu talk about the story to the Dalai Lama when the Dalai Lama asked him to pray for his persecuted people. And Desmond Tutu, this old short man with this very high-pitched voice, was hunched over looking at the Dalai Lama and he told him this story. And before he prayed for his people, he said this, the thing you have to understand about my God is this, when suffering gets close, he gets closer. When the world around you gets hard, he gets closer. When doubt begins to circle around you, he gets closer. When insecurity wants to call your name, he gets closer. When depression wants to tell you about who you really are, he gets closer. Because that's who he is. That's who he is. Come on, will you stand with me? So Jesus, just have our hearts today. My prayer for my people, God, is not that they would believe my opinions. God, I, I, don't, I don't want my opinions. I want you. I want you and I want all that you have to offer us. Today, Jesus, may we just be caught by the immeasurable love that you have for us. May any who just need to feel safe enough to say I'm hurting, 
find that today. We love you, Jesus. And we're, we're so thankful in your name. Amen.